Um, anyway, um, I thought a more interesting um, uh, topic for a general philosophy seminar was um, this idea I had long, long ago. I mean, it's a it's an idea that seems to be important and interesting to me, but I keep working at it. And um, so <clears throat> I'm on the verge of actually submitting the paper, but my co-author Dave Ripley and I um, uh, wanted to run it by you and see what you think. So that's, that's the plan. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, so just quickly, um, I don't know how I would, I guess I can ask Ellie, um, like how many people in the group in general would be aware of like Curry's paradox and all that, like 20%, 50 okay, okay, lower, okay, perfect, perfect, okay. Um, okay then, so my first goal is just to explain to you what Curry's paradox is. And then after that, I'm going to give one um, interesting, philosophically interesting um, and fairly um, um, prominent solution to it. And then the target of the papers try to say how the problem with that solution, okay? Um, I don't tend to like to do just negative papers. Um, but you can look at this as sort of a negative result. It's not actually that sharp, but I actually think this problem, Curry's paradox is so difficult and so foundational that anytime you can show um, a dead end, that's important. And so that's the aim of the paper is to show a dead end for a certain approach. Okay. Um, so, Curry's paradox is one of um, a handful of what are called truth theoretic paradoxes. Um, the most famous of these is the liar paradox. So the liar paradox is a sentence that says of itself only that it's false um, <clears throat> or to cut to the chase, only that it's untrue. And um, uh, so one standard principle about truth is the T schema or the T rules. And these tell us that a sentence is true if and only if what it says is the case. So if you have a sentence that says nothing more nor less than I'm false or untrue, whatever, then according to the T, the T schema, that sentence I'm false is true if and only if it's false. So you quickly get to uh, a certain problem. So according to the standard theory of logic, every sentence is either true or it's false. So if you've got this sentence that's true, if and only if it's false, then either way, you're going to get that it's both. And there you have problems according to if, if the standard story of logic is correct. Um, why do these, some people who, when they first confront these think, well, this is little more than just a puzzle, like some, you know, some unimportant puzzle. I think that that's absolutely the wrong um, idea to have about this. Um, one of the central notions in philosophy, no matter what your view of it may be, uh, one of the central notions is truth. And to, one of the basic questions is, how does this central notion, truth, behave? If you say that something's true, what logically follows? Or if you say a sentence, does anything about its truth follow from that? These are very, very fundamental elementary questions about one of the most important um, uh, notions in philosophy. Now, you may have a philosophy of truth where truth is kind of deflated or it's this or it's that, fine. You still have to answer, how does it work? What are, what are the implications of saying that something's true? And what does it take for something to be true? And those are the basic um, principles that 
the liar paradox um, calls into question. So um, if you think that truth plays what I call capture and release, that is, if you say some sentence A is true, does that release A, does that entail A itself? So the sentence snow is white, if that's true, does that entail that snow is white? And what about the opposite? So the standard idea of truth is that both of those principles hold. But if both hold and the standard story of logic is correct, then absurdity follows from the liar. Um, okay, so there are a number of things you might say. You might give up the principle of release. You might say that true A does not entail A um, in general, or you might say the converse fails. Um, and if you're going to hold to the standard story of logic, generally you're going to say one of those things one way or the other. Um, but um, in my view, a more interesting and more promising approach is to say, look, that's just how truth behaves. Don't give those up. What you should be giving up is the standard story of logic. Um, logic is weaker than the standard story says it is. And in particular, on the view that I endorse, though we won't get into this too much here, um, uh, not every sentence need be true or false. Um, but more importantly, in this context, a sentence can be both true and false without incoherence following, okay? Um, so the first step is to understand that truth is a fundamental notion and it's, its very principles of implication are called into question by the liar paradox. And the sort of solutions that I care about are ones that say the right response to the liar paradox is to say that the standard story of logic should be rejected. Logic is weaker than the standard story. Okay. Um, now, whichever direction you go, whether you're giving up excluded middle, that is the principle that says every sentence is true or it's false, or you're giving up the, the dual of that, namely explosion. Um, uh, this is the principle that says from an arbitrary contradiction, everything follows. Okay, so the, the, the views that we're looking at are ones where um, the truth behaves the way it normally does. It's just uh, the standard story of logic is weaker than, um, uh, sorry, the, the, the correct account of logic is weaker than the standard story says. <clears throat> and either excluded middle fails or, or explosion. So whether you have contradictions that can be true or you have some uh, gaps, some sentences that can be neither true nor false. For our purposes today, it doesn't matter. Um, um, Curry's paradox comes in to say, um, in effect, no matter which way you go on um, the, the liar, whether you are saying that this is a glut, both true and false, or whether it's a gap, neither true nor false, no matter which way you go, um, you still have very serious problems. Um, and the problems arise from what are called Curry sentences. Um, okay, let me try to just share a screen quickly because I don't know who has. Um, there should be there should be a copy of a paper that was sent around. Maybe um, this is the the one on my website is actually a slightly older, well, a lot older copy. But um, uh, you don't need that. But what I'm going to try to do is just uh, draw this. Um, we'll see how this goes. So blame uh, Lewis if uh, if this doesn't work because he he put me on to Wacom uh, and so that's what I'm going to try here. Okay, so a Curry sentence says something like, um, "If I'm true, then." Um, 
then blah, where blah is your worst nightmare. So then you can let the you can let this thing um, here be one equals two. Um, uh, Axel is a poached egg. Um, like just any any absurdity you want. Okay, so. A curry sentence says, if I'm true, then whatever absurd you, thing you want goes in. Okay, that's true too. Um, now, depending on what your conditional is, if then, um, you this might reduce to a liar sentence. So if it's a material conditional, then that's just equivalent to either I'm untrue or this other thing is um, then badness, uh, Axel is a poached egg. Um, um, but you already have a solution to that. You either say you, you think it's gappy or you think it's true and false or something like that. Um, the trouble is many people think um, that the material conditional is not itself sufficient as a conditional um, and that the conditional that underwrites the T schema. Uh, so I'm going to put some symbols here and I'll explain what that is uh, in a tick. Um, okay, so when I talk about the T schema, I mean something like that, where the T is just the truth predicate and the angle bracket is just a way of naming the sentence A. So we would, so an instance might be, um, you know, snow is white. Uh, all right, now I'm just scribbling. Uh, snow is white is true. Uh, uh, if and only if uh, snow is white. Okay. Um, um, so this would be an instance where A is in English and the angle brackets would be quotation or something. Um, okay. Um, so curry, so curry sentence is one that says of itself only that if I'm on, if I'm true, then badness. Um, you might have a solution to the material curry. Um, and we're assuming you do by saying logic is weaker than the standard story. But what about um, <clears throat> what conditional is involved in the T schema? Um, if you think that the T uh, by the T schema, I mean that thing that I just wrote the true A if and only if A, which conditional is that double arrow, which by conditional? If that's the material one and you say that the um, the if the curry sentence on top is a material conditional and you say that that's gappy, neither true nor false, then you're going to get that the T schema isn't universally true. Um, if you say that it's a glut, not a gap, that is that it's both true and false. Okay, no problem. Um, and you say that the T schema is using that material conditional, well, you'll have all true by conditionals, but modus ponens won't, won't work. So you won't have the validity of modus ponens for the T schema. Um, I have my own views about how big a problem that is, but, but we're setting that aside. The usual response is, look, the T schema is universally valid and the conditional satisfies modus ponens. By modus ponens, I mean, and I'm going to clear this because my eraser function won't allow me to do it. Uh, well, maybe I can actually, let me try. Okay. Uh, look at that. Okay, now let me figure out what I was using up here. Was I using this? Yeah, okay. Um, um, so the standard story is that the T schema is universally valid and 
the conditional involved obeys modus ponens. Modus ponens is simply from, oh man, I'm still using the eraser, sorry. Uh, uh, modus ponens, oh man, I should ask uh, Louise how to, how to use this. Okay, I think this will work. No, um, just a minute, let's see. Okay, so modus ponens is just this argument form. Um, we go from a uh, sentence A, a conditional, to the consequent of the conditional uh, B. Um, so the standard view is that the T by conditional um, satisfies modus ponens, okay? Um, the trouble is curry now will be a problem if you also have this. This is called contraction. Um, so if this is valid, and I'm writing this sort of therefore sign because I don't, I want to say that modus ponens is this form, and then you can ask whether it's valid or not, or, uh, and um, contraction is this form, and you can ask whether it's valid. If you have both of these, modus ponens and contraction, if they are both valid, and you've got the validity of the T schema, then where your language can express Curry sentences, you get trouble immediately. Um, and if you look at page two of that, um, that handout or that paper, that basically runs through how the problem goes. Basically, the T schema tells you that this sentence up here, okay, this sentence right here, I don't know why it's not writing, this one. If you let that be your C in the, on page two, basically the T schema tells you that that sentence is true if and only if, if it's true, then absurdity. Um, then because the sentence is equivalent to the claim that it is true, you can substitute and you get, um, if I'm true, then, if I'm true, then absurdity. And that's going to entail this uh, both ways. Eventually you get down to deriving Axel as a poached egg from um, uh, modus ponens. Um, I can actually step through, through this um, in one minute without all the symbols. So you've got a sentence saying of itself only that if I'm true, then Axel's a po poached egg. Okay. Well, how do you prove a conditional statement? I mean, prove it. I don't mean like, how do you come to believe it or anything like that? How do you prove it? Well, you use what's called conditional proof. You assume the antecedent is true and you see if you can validly deduce the consequent. Uh, the antecedent is the if part, the consequent is the then part. So um, we've got a Curry sentence right up there in the circle here. If I'm true, then Axel's a poached egg. All right, well, let's uh, um, assume the antecedent, namely that that sentence is true. Well, of course, if it's true, then what it says is true. So if it, so we derive from the supposition that of the antecedent that the whole thing is true, we derive the whole thing, namely, if it's true, then bottom, uh, then Axel's a poached egg. Well, now we've got by supposition, the antecedent, and now we've got the whole conditional. So by modus ponens, we derive uh, just in the context of, of conditional proof, we derive that Axel is a poached egg. But now notice, 
by conditional proof. We first assumed this, that told us that the whole thing is true. Then we took that first supposition and we took the, tr the truth of the whole thing and we derived that by modus ponens. Well, that's all there is to conditional proof. It says if by assuming the antecedent, you can validly derive the consequent, then you've proven the whole conditional. So we've got that this thing is true by conditional proof. So that conditional is true. But hold on. The truth of that by the T schema, since this is true, let that be A in your T schema, since this is true, it entails its antecedent, namely that the whole thing is true. But now we've got the truth of this conditional, the truth of its antecedent, and now by modus ponens again, we just derive that, that Axel is a poached egg. All right, so that's, that's sort of Curry's paradox um, in a nutshell. Um, are there any questions or will, will, oh, we're good. Okay, we're good. Okay, um, now, what I wanna do is I'm gonna clear this. Um, um, now, how do we, how do we go about um, avoiding the absurdity that comes from um, Curry's paradox? I'll, I'll put a couple of desiderata up here. One is we want the validity of the T scheme, okay? For whatever your conditional is like, you want that. And you want um, uh, modus ponens uh, to be valid, okay? So the turn, this, this thing, the sideways T, <clears throat> Um, a turn, single turnstile, that's just a way of marking that the thing is sort of logically true according to that relation, okay? So we want this to be valid. We want all instances of the T schema for the given conditional to be true. We want modus ponens to be valid, but we've already seen, and of course, if we were together and I could present this a little bit more smoothly, it'd be even easier to see, but we've seen that we had better not get a contraction um, Boom. Now, if you're asking, well, in that simple informal derivation that you gave us, you didn't say anything about contraction. That's true. but it's hidden in what I was saying. And seeing that is not important. Um, um, so what we want is we want to maintain the T schema, unrestricted, um, uh, universally valid T schema. Um, we want unrestricted, universally valid modus ponens for the arrow, the, for the conditional that's in the T schema but we don't want contraction, okay? All right, now, um, I'm just looking at the time. Um, I realize we started at like quarter past or so because of all the technology, but I don't wanna keep you here all day either. <laughs> um, so the question is, how do we lose that but maintain these? How do we get rid of this or, but maintain those? Okay. Um, here's the idea. Um, and please ask questions because I'm gonna, I'm gonna streamline this. And I think if I were in your shoes, I would have a lot of questions um, from my stream if, if I were speaking right now, especially over Zoom. Actually, it'd be interesting to ask myself those questions, but all right. Um, here's the idea. First, 
We want to make the typical distinction between extensional uh, and intentional connectives, sentential connectives. The term intentional with an S is used in a lot of different contexts. In philosophy of language, of course, it has to do with failure, substitutivity of equivalent uh, things. That actually is involved here too, but don't we won't worry about that. Uh, I'm gonna tell you exactly um, what I mean by it. Um, uh, I'm going to explain it in a way that invokes a standard possible world setting, okay? So we're gonna have a bunch of possible worlds. There they are. Those are the worlds, although you can call them whatever you want. I don't, it doesn't matter really. Um, call them points, call them situations, call them whatever you want. All we need are points at which sentences are true or false, okay? But I'll call them worlds. Um, an extensional connect, so you've got a bunch of worlds in here. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. Extensional connectives, um, their truth and falsity conditions never go beyond the world they're at. So, for example, if you're looking at the truth and falsity con uh, conditions for conjunction, okay? I'm not gonna write all this out because it's too tricky with the whiteboard, but um, uh, this is the logical conjunction of sentence A and sentence B. Such a sentence, a conjunction is true at a world if and only if what? Well, if and only if A is true at that world and B is true at that world. You don't have to look at these other worlds to, to answer whether the conjunction of A and B is true there. All you have to do is look there and see whether A is true and whether B is true, okay? That's all we mean by extensional. Um, notice, even though I'm not gonna talk about this, think about the standard alethic uh, modality like necessarily true, right? That's a very different kind of uh, sentential connective, often written uh, as, as a box, um, that sort of sentence, right? The truth conditions for that are box A is true. It's necessarily true that A, that's true at a world, if and only if what? If and only if at all worlds, the sentence inside is true, right? So you see the difference. In order to evaluate an intentional connective like box at a single world, you have to look at other worlds, what's going on, okay? Um, in order to, uh, or you have to, I mean, think of the diamond, it's possible that, I mean, suppose we're looking, okay, it's possible that, um, Axel's a poached egg. Okay, well, he's certainly not a poached egg here at this world. So now you do have to look to see whether it's true here. You got to look elsewhere. Um, okay, but but if it were true, you wouldn't have to look further, given the way possibility works. Okay, so keep these two in mind when you think of the difference between extensional and intentional connectives. Extensional connectives like conjunction. Um, uh, its truth conditions are tied to the single world. You never look, have to look beyond. Intentional, you have to look beyond where you're evaluating. Okay? All right. Um, okay. So now back to the project. The project is we're trying to keep this valid, modus ponens valid with the same arrow underwriting the T schema, and we're trying to lose contraction. Okay. All right. How is it done? Well, the way it's done um, in the target views is first off, this is an intentional uh, 
connective. It's not extensional. And its truth and falsity conditions um, are sort of like, kind of partially like ones that you'd imagine for a lot of conditionals. So basically, we're going to say that a sentence of the form a arrow B um, is true at a world, okay? So the arrow that we're talking about is going to be true at a world if and only if there's no world in the space of all the worlds. There's no world at which the antecedent A is true and the consequent untrue. Okay, that's a very standard thought. Um, actually, can I, if I erase this, is that going to throw everything else off? Um, okay, I can't see people, but I hope nobody's saying don't erase. Um, um, I think it's fine. I oh. mean, nobody commented anything, so uh, okay, just go good. ahead and. Good. I thought you were about to say, yeah, don't erase it. All right, good. Yeah. While I was already. All right. Um, okay. So what we're doing, you remember what we're, the project is to keep the T schema as valid, keep modus ponens valid, but lose contraction. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that uh, a arrow B is true. All I mean by this now is it, this thing is true at this. It's just shorthand. Otherwise, it would take us forever. Um, so this is true at a world if and only if um, for all worlds in the whole space of worlds, um, either um, um, either A is untrue there or um, B is true there, okay? That will definitely, and I won't pause to prove it, you trust me on this one, um, that will definitely give you modus ponens. That will, the problem is, and the T scheme is not a problem. Uh, the trouble is it will also give you contraction. There's no way you're going to get uh, this to fail on that picture. Why? Because um, for this to be to for this to fail, for this to be invalid, you'd have to have a world in which that's true, but that isn't. Um, well. If this isn't true at a world, then you go back up here and you see what that would mean. For this not to be true at a world is for that world to be such that, for there to be some world where A is true and B isn't, right? So for this to be untrue, you'd have to have a world where A is true and B isn't. Okay, but if that's untrue, then this is untrue uh, at that world too right? Because we're at the same world where this is untrue. We know there's a world in which A is true and B is untrue because we're assuming that there's a counterexample to this and we're assuming this is untrue. So that's untrue there. But hold on, A is true at that point. So this can't be true. But in order to have a counterexample to contraction, you have to have this side true and this untrue. Okay. Um, so now we finally get to the target solution. Since this won't do the trick, what will? Um, well, here's the trick. We go back to our big space of worlds. That's big W. Got some worlds in here. Um, but we make a distinction. 
within the whole big space of worlds, we're going to recognize what are called the normal worlds. Normal. And everything else in there is what you'll just call non-normal. Okay? Now, what does this distinction do? Well, now we're going to say that the semantics for this conditional are, as I call it, jumpy. At normal points, the semantics are just this. That's the way it is. When you're evaluating one of these arrows, you evaluate it here, and it just has this standard story. But when you're in an abnormal world, here, um, there are lots of different uh, ways of doing it. But just the simplest is, once you're outside the normal space, this is a value, any arrow statement, any conditional statement is evaluated just arbitrarily. So if you're out here, flip a coin, and that's the value of the conditional. If you're in here, the value of the conditional at any world in the normal space is just this standard thing. Okay? Um, that alone won't do anything for us because now, well, well, first I want you to see something. Just on that distinction, notice that we can now have a world where um, this, is, this is true and this is untrue. It's going to be a non-normal one. Why? Well, just let, just let A be true here. Um, and let... Uh, Let that be true there. Remember, it's just arbitrary. So we can let it be true, but don't let B be true there. Okay? So we're at a non-normal world where A is true and the arrow statement is true arbitrarily, that's how, but B isn't. Now go back to a normal world and you've got, um, suppose that this is true at a normal world, then this tells us that every world where A is true is one where that's true. Okay, suppose we set it up that way. Maybe there's only this one abnormal world, that's fine. So that's all, that's all good. And suppose that anywhere in here where A is true, B is true, okay? So then this premise is true. Um, but this one isn't. Why? Because there's a world where A is true here, but B isn't here. Um, so what we see is once you add non-normal worlds and you allow the semantics of this to vary, once you get outside the normal space, then you get rid of contraction. Um, that's subtle, but I hope, I hope people can see it. Um, if not, just somebody tell me there's a question. Um, the problem is you also lose modus ponens, which we were trying to keep. Why do you lose modus ponens? Well, you've got a world where A is true, you've got a world where A arrow B is true, and you've got a world where B isn't true. That's a counterexample to modus ponens. But our task was to keep modus ponens and lose contraction. Okay, what's the solution? Well, on the target solutions, the validity relation itself is tied to this space. 
So when you say that the argument from A to B is valid, according to this, what you're saying is there's no normal world at which A is true and B isn't. So when you're talking about validity, you're only going in here. When you're talking about the value of this in here, that pushes you out, but validity only looks in here. And just to quickly see, notice that once we do that, we restrict this to the normal worlds. Um, once we do that, the definition of validity restricted to this space, notice that you get modus ponens back because this relation of validity doesn't care whether there's um, uh, a counterexample out here. It just doesn't care. You'd have to have one in here and you're not going to find it. But there, there's still a counterexample to contraction. It's the same counterexample we had. You, you evaluate this at, say, the actual world. Let that be the actual world, which is normal. Um, this still tells you any world whatsoever where A is true is one where that's true. Well, you've got that. Any world whatsoever where A is true, that's true. No problem. But this is true at the actual world, which is what this cares about. Well, this cares about the normal ones, but the actual one is there. But notice that this is still untrue because this arrow looks at the whole space. This arrow, for it to be true, you have to have uh, every world be such that A is true. If A is true, then B is. So you keep modus ponens by restricting validity to the normal ones, but you lose contraction. Um, that's, the, that's the big trick. And now the question is, how do you make any philosophical sense of, of what these abnormal worlds are doing? And that I want to get to uh, now. And then I want to give you the three-minute punchline of the, the paper. Uh, There's a lot of setup just to give you the idea of uh, what's wrong with all this. Um, Axel, did you have a question? Yeah. Is, does the actual world always have to be normal? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, although, don't talk with your colleague, Lewis, um, because uh, I, I think his actual world is about as abnormal as you can get. Um, um, uh, and I'm talking about the trivialism stuff there, but okay. All right. Um, okay. So now let me tell you. So, to, so does everyone remember what we were trying to do? We were trying to keep the T schema. We wanted it to satisfy modus ponens. Um, and we didn't want it to satisfy contraction because otherwise these curry sentences just lead to badness. Um, the target family of views and, um, um, uh, a former, uh, slice of me, um, advocated this approach until I realized the problems that it's facing. Um, Graham Priest is an advocate. Ross Brady is an advocate. Uh, Hartree Field is an advocate in a different vein. Um, um, so this is sort of a prominent way of um, keeping modus ponens, getting rid of contraction. But now as philosophers, we want to ask, well, you can do anything you want with just a bit of mathematical squiggles. I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't pay out in, in the real philosoph philosophical problems. I agree. So the question is, how do we make real sense, philosophical sense of this picture of normal versus abnormal? The views, the target positions um, of the paper that uh, Dave and I wrote um, think that truth and falsity conditions do explanatory work. And they have to do that work by real sort of, you know, there has to be some real sort of 
philosophical weight to the ingredients. Uh, uh, um, so Graham Priest, and I'll just um, I'll just quickly read a quote. It's in this paper, but he gives typical for him. You know, it's very clear and um, and very interesting. Um, uh, so. Um, Priest's answer to how to make philosophical sense of this, uh, this picture of the abnormal worlds or non-normal worlds is as follows, quote, um, the normal worlds are to be thought of as logically possible worlds. So these in here are logically possible ones, the normal ones. Non-normal worlds are to be thought of as logically impossible worlds. The idea that there can be physically impossible worlds, that is worlds where the laws of physics are different, is a standard one. Such worlds are still logically possible, they're just physically impossible. But just as some worlds have laws of physics different from the actual physical laws, so some worlds have laws of logic different from the actual logical laws. And so Graham uh, Priest's picture here, explanation is, the normal worlds are the ones where the, the actual laws of logic hold, and the abnormal ones are worlds where the laws of logic just can go crazy. Um, so that's his picture. And he thinks that with that picture, um, when you're giving the semantics of a conditional, the conditional has to be given for the full space of worlds, both logically possible and impossible. And when you do that, uh, you get this result. And now you might ask, well, why restrict validity only to the logically possible worlds? And his reply will be, well, because that's what validity is, relation that governs logical uh, the logically uh, possible worlds. Okay. So now here's the thing, you've got this Curry paradox. Doesn't matter whether you think they're gluts for the liar or gaps or whatever, Curry comes up. You want the conditional to detach. You want it to underwrite the uh, unrestricted T schema. Um, but you have to avoid contract or avenues of solution that I'm not talking about. In the target views, these are the main players. Contraction, you have to invalidate. How do you do it? Just so, draw a distinction between normal and non-normal worlds, restrict the validity relation to the normal ones, but allow the semantics of the arrow to go the whole space. Uh, what's the philosophical explanation um, for Priest? Uh, the normal space are the physically, uh, are the uh, logically possible worlds, um, the ones to which the logical validity is tied, and the ones beyond are the impossible. But when you give semantics, you have to cover the whole space, not just the logically possible. All right. Um, I'm going to end in five minutes, uh, but I'm just going. <laughs> now, here's the whole punchline of the paper in five minutes. So if we were together, this would have been a lot smoother and easier, but um, OK. I'm, before I give it though, I have to, is, is, are there any questions about what I've done? Not, not, I mean, okay. Cause that, that picture needs to be there for you to understand why there's anything. All right. Here's the, here's the punchline of the paper. It seems to me that, okay. Uh, and, and to Dave, okay. You know, um, worlds are so unfamiliar and strange and so far removed from us that Okay, sure, <laughs> sure, that's fine, no problem, whatever. Um, time is a little different. Time is sort of in the worlds. Um, I'm not trying to push a particular philosophy of time, but um, uh, time, um, is something at which sentences can be true and false, just as worlds are, whether they're normal or non-normal, times are things at which sentences can be uh, true or false. Um, well, 
Just as we can make the distinction between extensional and intentional uh, connectives, uh, extensional and intentional, um, the intentional connectives you evaluate by looking beyond worlds, the extensional you always look at the world. Well, there's a distinction too that we might make between extemporal and intemporal uh, connectives, just by analogy with uh, that. Um, um, the intemporal connectives are temporal connectives that make you look beyond the time you're at. So to evaluate a claim like um, uh, JC is talking, to evaluate that, um, you can evaluate it at different times. If you now apply the connective, it will be that to the sentence JC is talking, um, that's good to evaluate that. You have to look beyond where you're standing at, at future times, or it was the case that JC was talking. That, that's an intemporal connective because it pushes you to look at other temporal points. Extemporal is like extensional. Um, extemporal connectives, you look just at the time you're at. Um, uh, okay. Now, um, in the last two minutes, um, what we say is that uh, whenever uh, A, B, that is a binary connective that um, is <clears throat> um, uh, satisfies the T schema because after all, whenever A is true, A, <laughs> and whenever A, A is true. So you're gonna get the, the, the arrow for the whenever is gonna go back and forth. Um, uh, we use that in the paper, so um, that would be the biconditional. Um, you get the T schema, you get modus ponens, uh, because suppose whenever A, whenever A is true, B is true, and A is true, well, you should get the B is true there. Um, so if you're at a time, where A is true, and it's true at that time that whenever A is true, B is true, then B ought to be true at that time. Um, and finally, though, you're going to get contraction um, uh, on any standard way of doing uh, the whenever <clears throat> connective. Now, you might say, so what? Well, the point is, uh, a completely neglected Curry is whenever I'm true, whenever I'm true, uh, you know, uh, Axel's a poached egg. Now, you should see that this is structurally the same as the original curry. Here's the rub. It looks like the solution that draws the distinction between normal and non-normal points has to be the same solution here. But now, it's again, it's one thing to think of worlds as being these bizarre things. But now we've got times in this world. So I'm not going to do it now because of time. But um, you, in the paper, we, we briefly prove that for any world whatsoever, if you're going to get rid of contraction for any world whatsoever, there have to be non-normal times. There have to be times at which the laws of logic fail, to use priests. Uh, and, you know, as we put it in the paper, worlds are so far removed, it's like, well, okay, whatever. But times are just, you know, a minute away or an hour away or something like this. And so... There's no explanation at all of how 
logical laws would just fail at a time in the actual world. And then suddenly they're fine. Or, you know, I mean, so this looks to us like if you're going to take this fairly standard solution and think of it in the way the priest has thought of it and others as explanatory, you're, you're committed to non-normal times. And not just non-normal times somewhere out there in some other possible world. Here, every world, normal or not, has to have non-normal uh, uh, times. Times at which the laws of logic fail if you're going to lose contraction. And that just seems like really hard to understand uh, at the very least. So, so the point of the paper is just to one present this neglected uh, um, uh, Curry paradox, but show the pressure it puts on these fairly prominent solutions. Um, so uh, I will close there, but I actually have like, there might be different ways of getting around the, the non-normal times, but I actually have a real kicker problem that turns the heat up uh, all together on the whole program that if we run out of time in discussion, I'll give you. If we don't, we'll talk another time. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'll stop there because there's a question and we've gone for a while. So thank you. Uh, I don't get it. Yeah, it's gonna. So we now open uh, the floor for questions. I see a raised hand from four, from too many people. So I'm just gonna choose randomly in the order I saw them appear. And the first one was Oliver. Great, thank you. Um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna be slightly presumptuous and ask a question that JC has probably heard before, um, just allow him to kind of riff on the answer, because I think that would make the view he's ultimately attacking more plausible and therefore the problem he raises for that view more striking. Um, because the, the obvious, the, the, the worry that immediately occurs to me with the solution is that, well, there was something obviously confusing about the idea of worlds of which the laws of logic fail. So is it such a surprise that there's something confusing about uh, times at which the laws of logic fail? So here's uh, the question I want to ask. There's this old issue in modal epistemology um, about whether conceivability is a good guide to possibility. So a lot of people think it seems conceivable that the morning star might not have been the evening star, but of course that doesn't mean that it's it's possible because everything is identical to itself. And so given that conceivability isn't a good guide to possibility, it seems that if you believe that that's an issue, the same issue is going to arise about the distinction between normal and non-normal worlds. So when we're describing a world in which the laws of logic fail, does it just seem like we're conceiving of such a world, but it's not really a possible world? Um, so I think if JC could answer that kind of question, it might make the view that he's ultimately attacking more plausible and therefore make his criticism of that view more striking. I hope that's helpful. That is helpful. Thank you. Um, um, I think in some ways, um, both the epistemology um, and the metaphysics are somewhat secondary questions. Um, uh, not in any way unimportant or anything, but uh, for the for the in fact, I think both of them are very important. But um, um, how exactly all these worlds line up with conceivable or you know uh, conceivable but not possible or this or that um, or what are they metaphysically? Or what you know? 
I think that these questions need to be answered, but the, they're secondary to the issue. The issue ultimately is whether these things, whatever they are, figure in the true semantics for the, um, the expressions. Um, so, you know, Curry's paradox is a real, it's a, it's a tough one. It makes you try to just make some sense of, of what's going on with the language and so on. Um, and, um, you know, one person could simply, um, give up and say, well, Hey, it's all a game. Don't take this stuff too seriously or something like that. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, I think that I think that that would be premature. I think rather that um, there are such things as truth and falsity conditions um, for the language, uh, for predicates, there are satisfaction conditions um, and so on. Um, and what Curry's paradox forces is a reassessment of what those conditions look like. Um, and I think if you really think hard about what to say about some of these paradoxes, um, uh, you'll, you'll sort of see that um, you certainly are going to be forced to take seriously whether your whole view of logic and logical possibility is even, you know, close to right. Um, um, eventually, once you have the semantics down there, uh, considerations of metaphysics and epistemological challenges, uh, will and should, uh, arise. But I, but does it make sense? Do you, do you understand sort of why I say it's a little bit secondary? Um, I was, I was just looking for some intuitive force to the idea that we really understand what it is for there to be a world in which the laws of logic fail, right? So, you know, I mean, it, it does tie to semantics because um, your, you know, your argument on, for example, your Stanford Encyclopedia entry is that um, counter possibles, conditionals with a fault, with an impossible antecedent are, are not just trivially true. So that's what I meant by the connection to conceivability and possibility. What's our guarantee that that intuition is really an intuition into the nature of the language, which is what you want, rather than some kind of. So if you say, you know, if Hobbes had squared the circle, then you know people would have been surprised. What makes you so confident that this is a world in which Hobbes squared the circle? What, you, did you carry out one of those geometric pseudo proofs? They, those don't square the circle. Right? Yeah, I think that um yeah, so I see I see where you're coming from and I and I um um I think that hmm. I guess so I I mean I I think that there are different ways of or different different directions you you'll we approach problems uh, in philosophy and science and, and so on. Um, one direction to approach these fundamental paradoxes, um, restrict to true theoretic paradox. Um, um, one direction um, of approach is to focus on the entailment behavior of, of these things and try to say, well, if we put these two principles about the entailment behavior together, then then we'll make that sense of absolutely nothing. So what would it be like to have this one, but not this one? And you work on that as best you can while bracketing some of these questions about, you know, how do we make sense of it? Ultimately, by the way, I should emphasize that 
these, whether it's for counter possibles or what have you, um, when you have these, these non-normal worlds, as I was calling them, simply following uh, suit of the target position, um, they don't ultimately need to be worlds. I mean, if worlds are special things, you know, um, then, okay, they're not worlds. They are what? Well, they're these other things that are sort of like, you can think of them as, I mean, think about times, right? So John Burgess long for years and years and years has always said, um, people should learn their modal logic by learning about time and temporal logic first. And then the metaphysics just is all the same, you know? Uh, um, well, uh, maybe that's an overstatement on his part, but, but, but it, there's a point there. I mean, because times are things at which sentences can be true and false, right? Um, worlds are like that but not all things at which sentences can be true and false are worlds or times. And so these so-called non-normal worlds might be something altogether different. Um, so again, I'm not disagreeing or even pushing back. I completely agree with you that those questions sh uh, should be answered. But I think if you already take seriously the thought of giving a systematic treatment of truth, it's entailment behavior, and the semantics of the ingredients, whether it's conditionals, conjunctions, you know, and so on, it's hard not to take seriously this sort of picture. Um, and I realize that if this is the first time a person is um, encountering this, I, I, I agree completely with Oliver that I have not in any way made it clear why this you would be pushing this direction. But um, I, I think it's hard not to be when you look at uh, the difficulties of the of the problem. So um, as it were, the, the point is that in your view, your concerns about the in intelligibility of counter or logical worlds are so much less worrying than the Curry paradox and the problems with all the other solutions that we should consider going this way. Um, what I'm, what, what my, my view is this, that the kind of approach that I uh, presented, um, I think is one of the most natural and um, and promising approaches. But um, if the approach needs to be explanatory um, and not just, well, here's the mathematics and here's how the stuff falls out. Um, if, it's, if it's to be genuinely explanatory, um, <clears throat> I think that one has to apply it to um, to the temporal curry that doesn't get talked about, uh, by the way. Um, uh, um, and it just seems to me, maybe I'm, I don't know, it just seems a lot stranger to think that there are times in this world where the laws of, lo laws of logic fail. Now they could be way behind us. They could be in front of us. They could happen in the next five minutes. I mean, that we don't know, but on this approach, you're committed to those. Um, and that just seems like something that looks strange, uh, in, in ways that the non-normal worlds don't, because it's like, well, they can be whatever, and they don't really touch us <laughs> in any way. But I mean, I'm sorry, I'll just say one more thing, and I no. promise this is the last thing I say. But to me, you know, to I have to be able to describe another possible world, right? So it's like a way the world could have been, so I get at it by describing it. And I don't know what it is to describe, I don't know, um, 
I'm not sure I understand how to describe a world in which the law of excluded middle no, fails. Well, uh, if that's if that's all that you want, um, I, I'm not going to give you all that you want right now, but I can point you in the direction of. of I mean, these are going to be these are going to be so a non-normal world. We'll we'll keep calling it a world, even though that you know we can call it whatever. Um, um, you want you want me to describe it? Okay, well, it's a world at which um, you know um, <clears throat> uh, the sentence, uh, "If I'm true, then uh, Axel is a poached egg." Uh, that's true. Um, its antecedent is true at that world. At that world, but it's completely untrue that Axel is a poached egg at that world. And you say, how could that be? Well, it's semantics of the conditional. I mean, it's it's different at these points. Um, so, in some sense, it's easy to describe. But it's but like it's, the conceivability possibility thing. I don't get yeah. the confidence that you're really getting it right. Could, could, could be. Okay, guys, I'm sorry, but this is getting too long winded, and we have Fair four enough. more people. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so next question, Alessandro, please. Hi. So um, uh, I'm going to uh, um, have a, like a small terminological remark and then a, a, an observation. The, the terminological remark concerns uh, uh, your, your classification of the conditional as intentional. So I was just thinking that uh, if, if we're evaluating it against both possible and impossible words, it would be not just intentional, but hyper-intentional. Uh, and now the observation is this, uh, you're worried uh, about um, the temporal uh, curry that we may not have the, the non-normal or impossible worlds. Uh, and I was thinking, uh, now consider that we have a, a branching time model. Uh, so in the branching time model, there is a time branch, which is the actualized branch. And then there are many other unactualized branches. So branches that could have been, but in fact are not. Okay. So I, uh, uh, if, if the conditional were uh, whenever A, B, if, if that conditional were intentional, I would evaluate it uh, uh, against all the possible branches. Uh, so I would check if in every point of every possible branch, uh, uh, whenever A, B. Uh, now, if I want it to be hyper-intentional, then I will postulate that there are also impossible branches. So branches are not only could have been actualized, but didn't, but actually couldn't be actualized at all. So they're indeed impossible. And then I would ev uh, evaluate um, the uh, the the conditional uh, against the possible and impossible branches. Yeah. So, um, I think you may be right about the hyper intentionality. Um, you probably are. Um, uh, but I just have a follow up question um, on the way you're thinking of the branching time. Uh, so um, that, that's, I mean, the branching time really, uh, um, that could come, that really could soften this a little bit, possibly, possibly, I'm not sure, but like, um, are you, are you suggesting the branching time softens the oddity of the non-normal worlds? Okay, you are. Um, I, I, I essentially, I'm saying that, you know, if, if you are okay with, with allowing non-normal worlds in the general non-temporal model case, then uh, if you think of words as branches in the temporal case, then just assume that non-normal uh, non worlds are non-normal branches, so the impossible branches. 
So, so that is one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good point. Um, I, I was thinking of what you were uh, suggesting in a slightly different way, but um, I'm glad you said that as well. Um, but so one response, and I think we talked about this in the paper is, um, so think about, forget about the whenever thing. Um, so the, the original arrow with the T schema and all the big setup that we tried, that is um, um, intentional in the sense that it's looking at other worlds and so on, but it's extemporal in that um, it's, you know, it doesn't look to other times. I mean, in effect, the, t the time variable is just a dummy uh, with respect to the semantics there. Um, so, so you have an intentional arrow and X temporal in the sense that X temporal, it only looks at one time at a time and lets the worlds vary. Okay. In the truth conditions, what we're suggesting is, um, there's no reason to reject the existence of, um, the sort of opposite, which is, um, uh, an extensional, but in temporal. So now you never have to look at other worlds. You, you, the world variable is really a dummy in the semantics, but the T variable plays a lot of work. And we suggest that whenever is just like that. It, it's, uh, and one of the responses that we, we point to is that, um, this kind of approach might be saved from the oddity of, uh, of non-normal times in the actual world. By the way, what I didn't dwell on in this talk is that we prove that it doesn't matter what world you're at, you have to have uh, non-normal times uh, in that world. Um, you could avoid this maybe by rejecting the existence of an extensional where the world's kind of, you just stay at the world and you look at the times, uh, in temporal connective, you could reject that. And it sounds like motivation for that rejection might come from the branching time model as you're thinking of it. Um, and I hadn't thought of that. That's, that's, uh, worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So thank you. Okay. So next on the Please, this is Claudia Lorena. Uh, go ahead, please. Hi. Um, I didn't understand. Perhaps I missed something. But I, there, I mean, there was, um, you said, well, there is a paradox. Okay. Can you hear me well? Yep. Yeah. Okay. There is a paradox. And there is a solution to this paradox, which uh, would be to accept um, the uh, truth schema and uh, to accept modus ponens, but to reject um, uh, contraction, right? And um, then you say, well, the, the solution would be to distinguish normal from non-normal worlds, right? And, um, but then my question is, what is then, what do we do with the notion of validity? I mean, is validity still relative to all worlds, whether normal and nor normal, or only to normal worlds? If validity is only relative to normal worlds, then in I don't see how, I, I mean, I don't see maybe it, this is just some sort of technical question I don't know the answer to, but um, I don't see how you can say that in normal worlds, you can still accept the true schema, modus respondents, and the contraction is valid and not have the paradox arise again in normal worlds, right? I don't see that. Uh, or maybe the solution involves something else. I don't know. That's what yeah. my question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah uh, the, the answer is exactly as you predicted, which is that the validity relation um, is actually tied just to the normal worlds. So the, yeah, so the semantics for the arrow 
looks at the whole space, but but the definition of validity only looks at the normal ones. Mm. Yeah. Right, but I mean, wouldn't the paradox arise again in if you understand validity um, again? I mean, if you try to keep in normal worlds your three your three sentences, because you want in normal worlds to keep contraction as well, right? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. No, no, right. no, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we give up contraction on this view. You give up contraction is just bad. Oh. Uh, it's something that we should never have had in the first place, uh, at least for the conditional that underwrites the. Okay. Okay. Sorry, okay. I, I. Sorry, but it, you're on to something that I. I thought you were that close to this other point that I didn't have time to present. Um, uh -huh. but, things come crashing, I think. But anyway, okay. Is that good? Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, the normal worlds then look pretty strange to me <laughs> in any case. I mean, if you give up contraction, right? Uh, well, um, they do look strange until you realize that the arrow that no longer contracts, the right. doesn't contract because it's looking at these weird non-normal. Okay, I see that. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Thanks. No, you're but you're seeing it exactly right. It's just that's the point mm -hmm. that I think when you're in the sort of normal space, how could this thing fail? Well, because it's looking at these bizarre things. And then you say, okay. well, validity, well, validity is only looking at where we're at. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, okay, great, great talk, JC. Uh, my counter is going to go in the same direction as, as Torsa, uh, a similar kind of uh, suggestion of how to make it more palatable, which is that, okay, so one of the, I'm going to recover this last point in your reply to Claudio Lorena, which is that we, we have to be very careful and know what role normal and non-normal words play. Normal are for the logical properties, non-logical are all for the semantics of some operators, right? Good, good, good. And, and, and that's the key, I think, because uh, they are not required for the prior operators, right? The prior operators are gonna run on the normal ones. But yeah. that means, yeah, yeah. I just want to say that they would have to be defined over everything, but you could define them in the usual way. Uh, they, 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 they wouldn't distinguish. So I just wanted to flag that. Yeah. Okay. No, I, no, what I mean is, okay, I think that the, the, that the prior operators need to be defined only on the normal, ah. on the normal. I th because I think if you look at the, the way the, the, the normal temporal logic works, or uh, no, the normal temporal semantics, intentional semantics, they, they're always thinking that they're running on normal. I mean, all the theorems are, are running on normal. And that is good for a proposal that uh, like, I don't know if I can say like yours, because it's the one you're criticizing. Because if that is so, then you shouldn't worry that these times, weird and normal times are, uh, are weird, because if the prior operators do not reach them, that means that they are never going to happen and they have never happened, right? That's what it means to say that they are not within the domain of the prior operators. Mm. So if there are times that are never going to happen and they have never happened, then it's not, there's no problem in them being weird. Okay, that's a very interesting, um, and yeah, I see it's uh, similar to Alessandro's. Uh, um, uh, I mean, not the it's not the similar; yeah. it's sort of similar spirit, but different uh, strategy. Yeah, huh? Um, so, huh? So the only way I can make sense, well, let me just say, so, so as far as the paper goes, 
I would say, okay, defenders of this view, you know, give us the details. Let's see it. Um, so I, I, to both you and Alessandro, I mean, that would be progress is to make sense of the uh, non-normal times and give us a satisfying, both of you pointed in the direction where that might go. And that's, that's interesting. Um, let me just say though, that one thing they'd have to do is say, you know, on the standard temporal, uh, the temporal connectives tend to be all ride on an ordering of the times, right? Um, so, you know, to say it will never happen and never did, somehow the, the, the non-normal times would have to be incomparable with respect to the ordering, I think, but maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong about that. Uh, but in any event, both, that I, I now see the spirit of both uh, comments and, and that, that to me, so both of you should champion this view of Curry's paradox and give a, give a good philosophical explanation of why times are good. Uh, thanks. Okay, so next we have uh, Ricardo. Mm, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, I just want uh, to make a follow up on Lorena's question. And is um, if uh, this query, as, as the notion of validity is just defined on normal, normal worlds, yes. if uh, a version of this query paradox cannot emerge, uh, uh, arise from from to this notion of validity, perhaps uh, taking um, versions of uh, model exponents and contraction, but for the relation of validity, not uh, for the conditional. Uh, yes, well, um, Um, that's a that's a good question that I hadn't thought of, even though I've thought about validity curry uh, a bit. Um, um, but I think the answer is going to be no. Uh, um, and the reason is that um, it makes a difference to to the paper as I've done it anyhow uh, with Dave is uh, that there is this connective already in the language whenever. I mean, we're debating a little bit of, about how it works, um, but the validity relation, you'd have to sort of specify. Yeah, I, I, that, it's a good question. I just need some thought. I don't have anything useful to say, except I'm, I guess I'm a little skeptical, but, um, but the more I say that, the less, clear I become on why I'm skeptical. Um, so you might be right. Um, I just haven't thought about it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so Diego, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, I think that what, what I'm going to say uh, has something to do with what Axel and Alessandro said, but maybe it's a different different angle, but I I I want to I'm not sure if in which sense the you said that the, those are abnormal times are in the actual world, but I I don't see I I think that I think that maybe that's a an overstatement or something like that, because I think that there's a sense in the in which they are part of the actual world, just in the same way that the abnormal worlds are in the space of possibility or something like that. And I think that they are simply not there. Uh, well, I mean, so I'm now being pushed into thinking, ah, oh, it's all fine. Like, <laughs> you know, not normal times, of course, what else do you expect? Um, but, but I guess I'd push back a little bit on the way you put it there. Uh, um, in particular, <laughs> I, 
I mean, the times aren't there in the way that the tree is outside, right? I mean, okay, they're not there like that. You, you know, if you hit a time, you're not going to fall back or anything. Um, but um, but each world well I, I mean you'd have to reject that there's i mean i mean when when i ask you what time is it right um i mean there's something there's something there that's identical with whatever time it is, uh, you know? Um, so, yeah, I guess what you're saying is times are abstract in ways that worlds are and um, or the possible worlds are, non-actual worlds. Um, but uh, but non-actual, the actual times are abstract in the way that non-actual worlds are, is what you're saying, I guess. Um, I don't know. Again, I mean, it's it's similar to my response to Axel, which I I think I should have said as well to Alessandro, is that um, it's an interesting point, um, and it's what needs to be filled out. Um, um, so, do, I mean, I take it that all of you agree that the structural, the argument by an, by, by structural similarity is is right. The question is how much is the bite? And and you're pointing to interesting, very natural ways of reducing the bite. Um, okay, so if if you go until um, I guess you're an hour behind, so three, so to two o'clock, um, maybe uh, I should present just this one little hard nut problem that um, I didn't present, unless there are other questions. Uh, Diego, did I answer you sufficiently? Yeah, I, I think it's okay. Okay. Um. So I, Luis sent me a message saying that he had a question. I don't know if he would rather uh, ask you something and then. Okay, that's fine. I'm have you like present this problem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's really quick. Uh, thank you, JC. Good to see you. Good to see you. Well, I can't see you, but, yeah, um, no, but uh, you look great. Yeah, it's uh, black. <laughs> it's a great color. Yeah. Yeah, and, and as I have said, it, it's a quick question. Uh, is, is there anything special about time here? Have, have you thought about uh, 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 this version uh, of Curry for space or something like that? Hmm. Or, or, or the problem doesn't arise for, for space? Because you can have a similar condition out of whatever A is true, it's B is true. Or... Yeah, that, that's, a, that's the question. You, oh, oh, you said wherever, wherever. Is, is, is that what you said? Whenever, right. Oh, whenever. Well, when, oh. But the, no. wouldn't that just be the temporal? No, I, I no, I say it uh, wherever. Wherever, yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I, no, I haven't thought about it at all. And actually, that's a very good project. Um, is to chart the, um, you know, different varieties of curry. Uh, you know, maybe all the solutions apply to one should apply to all and so on but but that's a really that's a good point like there there are going to be structurally identical uh connectives that get completely ignored um, I, I i am a bit skeptical about the uniform solutions here because uh, uh the branching time approach sounds good to me but uh, i don't know if there is something like branching space or something like that to approach uh, this space query. No, no. Um, uh, uh, so Alessandro's solution wasn't just branching time. The solution was this non-normal solution. The branching time is supposed to 
help explain why this isn't such a big uh, deal. Uh, yes, I, I got it now. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, but that's a good project, Louis. Um, we should have a big Notre Dame uh, UNAM uh, uh, joint project on the flavors of curry. Uh, uh, Ellie, is there anyone else? Nope, I think this is it. Okay, so, so what I want to throw, what I want to throw at you before we say goodbye, is there time? Is there like three minutes? So, um, what I'd like you to think about, okay, there's a, just a couple of quick steps. Uh, the time is, uh, um, okay. By the way, I, at some point, I'm going to interact with UNAM so much, I really am going to learn uh, Spanish. I want to, a goal of mine is to present a talk in Spanish at some point, but not today. All right, so the time is uh, DT, okay? Where DT is date and time, okay? So like um, an instance of that might be like uh, May 5th, uh, 2021, 1800, Greenwich Mean Time and so on, okay? That's all this is, okay? Um, now, uh, at each world, right? This is supposed to be uncontroversial. At each world, um, depending on what you put in here, so let T0 just be one instance of May 5th, 2021 at such and so a time, okay? Let that be T0. At each world, this sort of sentence is going to be true at exactly one time, right? Namely, the time it is, right? Okay, hopefully that's uncontroversial. Um, okay, um, but that means now, let's, let's uh, let um, D, T, um, T just uh, sort of be this sort of sentence, right? Okay. So then um, at the actual world and the time zero, uh, DT zero is true at this, in the actual world, this sentence, the time is T zero is true exactly here and untrue everywhere else. Yeah? Okay, again, this is supposed to be straightforward, nothing, okay. Um, well, here's the thought. Um, uh, provided that your whenever arrow is um, arbitrary at these non-normal times. So let's grant that, forget, you're now convinced, okay, there are also non-normal times if we have this other approach to non-normal worlds and so on. This will not contract it will detach, it will satisfy modus ponens and it's fine with the T schema, the whenever thing. Okay. So no problem. You can't, you can't prove the, the derive the curry whenever the temporal curry in the normal way. But here's the thing, given that you've got these, these in effect serve as constants for the time. So in any given world, this sentence, the time is DT, say, zero, um, that, in effect, just pinpoints the time. Now, you say, so what? All right, here it is. Um, now consider, I got to erase that, sorry. Um, now consider um, just another curry, a temporal curry of this form. And again, I'm trusting your friendliness because I haven't um, uh, thought too hard about this. Um, now, I threw this N up here just to say, let T0 be a normal point, okay? Now, we're just looking at this sentence tied to this particular sentence. The time is T0, and we're, we're stipulating that T0 is a normal time, okay? So this says, if I'm true at time zero, then uh, Axel's a poached egg. All right. 
Um, now, evaluate that at the actual point, at the actual world, at time t0. Um, because the actual point is a normal point. Well, that sentence is true. I'm going to get rid of... Uh, I'm going to get rid of this and just write it like this. So this is true at uh, that time. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that time at the actual world, only if, um, by the semantics for the whenever, only if there's some time t prime at which um, the antecedent is true, right? Okay, so last minute. The, consider a Curry sentence that says, I'm true at t0. That's this, this sentence, the time is t0, blah, blah, is true at exactly one point in the actual world, namely t0. So this sentence is in effect saying, I'm true at T0, if I'm true, whenever I'm true at T0, um, badness. Uh, okay, how do you refute that? Well, for that to be untrue at um, T0 itself, at the actual point, the antecedent is gonna have to be true at some point T1, the antecedent has to be true but that can't be true anywhere but T0. So you can't go to a non-normal time to save you. And the point is, there's no way to refute that. Uh, there's no way to make it untrue. Anyway, uh, that may have been that may have been too fast, but um, the point is that when you have sentences that are true at a unique time, then stack them in the antecedent, and you're not going to be able to prove it from contraction because you're still you'll still be contraction free on the conceded um, uh, non-normal times and all that. But when you look at the sentence, it's like, how, where's your counterexample? That is, you've got to be able to evaluate it at T0, at the point that it's talking about. You have to be able to evaluate it there. And um, I don't see any way of making it untrue. All right, I'll, I'll stop. I hope that that's m mildly uh, interesting. Um, and if anyone figures out that I'm just confused, please, please, please email me. Or if you think I'm completely right, email me too. Um, okay. okay, so I cannot speak for anyone else, but I do think that was at least moderately interesting. So, <laughs> uh, thanks for the talk, JC, and thank you everyone for showing up, for making questions, and uh, hopefully we'll see each other next week. Well, the rest of us, that is. Okay. I mean, but we can make you a member of the <laughs> of the of the seminar. There you uh, go. Yeah. So, bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Goodbye.